so there's 10 second lag between uh, both uh, okay four okay we are live Tiago, can you check if um, the audio is fine in YouTube? Yes, it is fine. Okay, cool. I checked it. Cool, I think uh, things are fine. Okay, so I think uh, I'll put uh, everyone else on the backstage uh, and then we can start. Is it fine? Like if you start now or should we wait? Sure, just see that our registered participants are online. Okay. Yes. Uh, let's just refresh. Yes, the previous uh, LinkedIn link, I mean the event, will only work when I uh, direct this stream to uh, LinkedIn. I can't do both at once. So that is a problem. There. So that is why I've created another link. So as of now, we have uh, another link there on uh, LinkedIn where you guys have joined and on YouTube. So two things are working fine. And uh, okay, so audio is fine. Good evening. Okay, so YouTube comments are also, I can see the comments. So whenever you guys are ready, I think we can start. Uh, Yeah, we can start, Rukesh Gautam. Yeah, if uh, the participants have joined, we have enough members looking at it. Then we can just check the WhatsApp group as well if there are any more guys yes. waiting to join. We'll wait for another, say, five minutes and start probably. I think that would be okay, fine. We start at uh, 4 8. Yes, 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 yes. So I'll move uh, Rupesh to backstage. Uh, then uh, Vitriya will be here as of now. So I can see uh, participants join here on my screen on this link as well. So they are on the backstage. You guys can't see, but I can see. How many of them are joined? What's the number right now? Right now there are seven like participants apart from us, uh, apart from four of us. Okay, we'll wait, wait till. Uh... Pour it and then start. Yes, yes, yes.
Yeah, so the life uh, 11 folks on YouTube as well. Uh, hello all uh, those who are in the backstage uh, you guys can't uh, i mean i've not added you on the front stage but uh, i think hope you are well you are seeing the screen uh, all, uh, all of our faces so we'll start in uh, about uh, two minutes time at 4 10 and uh, uh, the structure will be that we'll introduce about the hackathon about what how this came into existence and then uh, what the challenge is about what you guys uh, have to do and uh, the entire schedule so there is some confusion that you guys have messaged me uh, personally as well so i will clarify all of those doubts so this starts the beginning of two week long uh, so or rather i should say three week long uh, grand challenge or hackathon the entire challenge will be virtual so you don't have to travel anywhere to win exciting prizes all right so one minute left and after that i just start sharing screen what from uh, aditya are you guys ready like yes okay. good to go all right so i'll move you guys uh, backstage and uh, once uh, i introduce everyone and then i'll move you to front stage Yeah. Cool. Uh, all set up. So good afternoon, guys. Uh, welcome all the participants, viewers or just ent enthusiasts who have joined this uh, webinar or educational uh, uh, 
uh, introduction to uh, edge computing in collaboration with uh, skysurf so uh, inter- i'll introduce myself i am aman um, i am part of ieee grss bangalore uh, section and i represent as vi- uh, young professional representative for this year uh, so we have been conducting hackathons and uh, events for last one year and i have also been part of a community in bangalore called as let's talk special which have we have been running for last two years now uh, more about that later so welcome to this uh, online hackathon or uh, rather a grand challenge on edge computing to begin with let me start by uh, the agenda we'll talk about a few important components that you guys should know about before we dive deep into the challenge i'll introduce grss chapter the young professional uh, organization under grss about uh, let's talk special which is a community group and finally we'll end up with the grand challenge so grss bangalore chapter uh, was started 10 years ago and uh, was the founding member or the front founding chair was uh, professor daya sagar who is at uh, indian in- statistical institute since then the chapter has grown strength by strength and now we have over 100 members in uh, the bangalore chapter alone so currently this year onwards uh, starting january this is the uh, the chapter slate or who leads the activities in this chapter this year shamlal sir is the current chair uh, followed by secretary is uh, chandan mc who is a professor at uh, nie shilpa suresh who is again a professor at uh, mit uh, ujwal verma again professor at mit myself i work at a company called galaxy and amrut uh, who is at uh, senior researcher at uh, ihs and below you see our advisors who have led the team in the past and uh, their support is what uh, drives us to conduct more hackathons and events so under uh, grss there is a body called as young professional which i represent from bangalore section the focus here is we want to encourage and support early careers like people from early careers be it students or young professionals who are in the industry we want to bring them and support them maybe via monetary funding or um, via career opportunities or events like these so that they excel uh, in the work that they do so young professional is not just part of grss it is the broader ieee um ieee section i mean ieee under the umbrella of ieee so last year we conducted one hackathon which uh, we actually won the runners up prize and got published uh, in uh, the local yp chapter this hackathon or the grand challenge is part of uh, an activity called as best local young professional chapter activity which happens every year and for this year we have been granted some amount to organize these kind of events to encourage participants from uh, various organization and uh, student bodies and as we do we collaborated with uh, let's talk special which um, four of us Uh, who is myself amrot thiyaku and santosh run so we collaborated with ieee grss and we have conducted uh, monthly meetups for almost two years so me- one meetup every month and uh, these kind of activities help us network and also get to know what is happening in the industry so we have done various event across various organizations the picture on the uh, right bottom right is of skysurf which we have again collaborated and uh, maybe in future we'll be having many such events so what is let's talk special so on the right you see the map of bangalore and uh, the points are where we have hosted um events or hackathons or workshops so it is a geospatial community which takes interest in remote sensing and the tech behind it all so the task for uh, this challenge the young professional challenge of 2024 is you have to develop an ai model which has to be deployed on the edge 
so maybe you don't know what is edge maybe you don't know how do you convert your ai model to edge but fret not entire thing will be taken care and uh, will guide you through the entire process all we need is your patience and your uh, hard work to make this possible so this is in collaboration with uh, skysurf so the skysurf team approached us and uh, they said that we want to conduct a hackathon uh, they have an idea and they want it to be hosted uh, i mean have a lot of participation from the community itself so that they get to see what is the power of edge computing so many thanks to skysurf for uh, helping uh, host this hackathon there has been a lot of efforts behind the scene uh, which goes into at least creating the first stage of uh, this hackathon so ieee young professional challenge because we are part of uh, ieee grss they help us uh, give this prize amount so we have kept uh, three prizes 15000 for the first prize 10000 for the second and 5000 for the third prize and for all the participants who participate e certificates will be given to each team member irrespective of uh, who wins the hackathon and the team size is uh, it should either be one or up to you can be two or three up to four so we have extended the registration till april 5th many of you who have registered before might have seen that the registration closes on uh, march 27 we have extended till april 5 and the link that you see here you can click on that i'll share the slides um i'll share the slides immediately and you guys can actually uh, those who are watching who have not registered can register for this event um so the idea is till april 5th you have the opportunity to register and on april 6th there will be a qualifier round uh, which will be that you have to present your idea what you want to develop over the next week so i encourage you all to register as soon as possible so you have time to think over what you want to uh, develop the solution for once you have a certain a uh, pathway as to what you want to develop there will be a qualifier round after which you have another one week to develop the solution using the handbook that will be released today so that is the action plan and uh, if you want to communicate or have any doubts we have uh, three uh, modes as of now you can email at let's talk special at gmail.com or the slack channel or the whatsapp group those who have registered have already received uh, a link to whatsapp and um, might have been added already if you have not been added email uh, me let's talk special at gmail.com or just message so the form link has also been shared um, soon after uh, this the presentation also will be shared with you so with that uh, uh i welcome uh, aditya who is uh, uh from skysurf team will present uh, on edge computing and entire hackathon uh, criteria events what this hackathon is about so with that i'll stop the screen and i'll bring aditya onto the stage hi aditya you can hear me Yes, on. I can hear. You. Okay, great. So, if you can present your screen, if you have an option there. Yes. Let me try this. Okay, is my. Screen okay, yeah. Screen? So I have to add it to the stage. I can see the screen. Ah, uh, your. Uh, presentation i'll just move backstage and if you have any questions uh, i'll come out to the stage again so sure. i'll move backstage yeah perfect thanks aman and uh, thanks to the itpl grss young professionals uh, group headed by aman uh, let's talk special and all of you uh, attending this webinar so uh, it's it's a very great opportunity to speak to people in the community about uh, Uh, new technologies that are coming up also is what we're trying to do uh, to make them more available accessible and also uh, spread the knowledge that there's there are new ways to interact with geospatial interact with uh, the rest of the world and uh, we're doing our our bit to uh, popularize uh, this uh, and in, ca in case 
you uh, look at the the two words right ai model uh, these have uh, taken the other industries by uh, surprise as to how quickly they have been incorporated so i think uh, the uh, most um, well known ones are are the large language models being used uh, uh, left right and center sometimes they are abused as well but uh those those are the things that have brought uh, ai models to the fore at least in the last uh 6 months and before that of course ai was very much there in in the consciousness but not not really taken everybody by surprise by what it can do so uh through this hackathon we are we are hoping to get uh people to develop stuff that will surprise uh, the world especially coming uh from uh, a community that's been built uh, over the years by uh, IEEE uh the the depth to which we can go versus the reach that we can have i think we need to leverage every opportunity that we get and uh, uh and the other part that you see in the hackathon topic right which is onboard edge uh so i'll start with that uh, as to what that is uh and uh, so to put it in a, a, a sort of dictionary definition uh it's when you have a lot of networked devices uh the device that can compute or uh, transform input data into something that is uh, understandable or usable to take action if that computing device is closer to where the data is being generated uh, or what it's called as the sensor edge uh, that is uh the sort of in short definition of edge computing that is you don't compute by aggregating data from all parts of say the world and process it at a data center uh edge means you're pushing that compute uh, capability closer to where the data is generated and uh, why this is done in fact if we look at uh, uh, another sector which is uh, internet of things iot uh iot has uh, basically brought a lot of sensor data into the cloud and when you aggregate data into the cloud uh, specifically these sensors they could be generating a lot of raw data like imagine uh, microphones uh, cameras say traffic cameras uh, uh, air pollution sensors at different stations uh, you could be aggregating even vibration data at say uh workshops factories so all this data if it had to just go to a few central processing uh data centers you have a lot of throughput required so you can't imagine to have fiber connecting every part of the earth right so uh this became very quickly obvious when internet of things started uh getting uh popularity and a lot of industries wanted to bring this in they started calling it industrial iot or uh uh industry 4.0 so very quickly the technology folks reacted by bringing a uh, small low power compute devices which can be put next to the sensor uh, in each of these places so one very good example is uh traffic cameras uh in some parts of the world can detect if you are uh, speeding and they can take a picture of your license plate and in your email or in your uh, sms you will receive a uh, Uh, a fine uh, a speeding fine and that is really automated but that does not mean that the video from the traffic camera or from the highway camera is being streamed to the police department this action is happening on the camera itself so this is a good example of uh, thinking about edge computing uh now what does it lead to as we saw in the traffic uh, camera example you can get lower latencies between sensing an action and over time this is generally where you can automate a lot of processes uh we we've, we've really not started probably we've done uh as of what we thought 10 years ago we probably have progressed in automating 1% of all the problems there's a lot more to do which is basically opportunity for all of us now if we talk about edge computing and then combine that with satellites uh what 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 does this mean so uh satellites for the last 6 6 and a half decades 
uh, have been used to do a lot of things. Uh, one of those is to look at the Earth itself. Uh, so while looking at the Earth, uh, the initial interest was, of course, to look at neighboring countries, to look at uh, not so friendly countries, to spy on them, to see what's going on. Uh, but over time, what we've managed to do is large scale mapping and uh, measurement of key parameters that are actually going to uh, become very critical in knowing is there a human impact on the Earth. And this is actually one of the great uh, learnings from the space age uh, starting six and a half uh, decades ago, which is there is a huge impact of uh, human activity on the rest of the world. And it is not just on the air, it's in the sea, it's on land. Uh, and very uh, quickly, uh, in just six decades, uh, we've managed to uh, pollute even space. So when satellites can be used to look at all this, uh, but we are still quite far behind in the way we do these analysis. We take a lot of time uh, to process the data, bring them into a form where uh, you can apply algorithms. You could probably even start training the algorithms to look for patterns in the data and uh, finally make some predictions and sometimes even forecasts. And this has been very uh, well done in the weather uh, part of this Earth observation industry. So uh, meteorological departments across the world, they have uh, cracked the uh, code to do at least 10 day forecasts in terms of weather. Uh, and it's also because they have very clear parameters to reduce any satellite image or uh, radar image into. So what they are reducing it to is uh, upper atmospheric winds. They're looking at density of uh, atmosphere at different heights. They're looking at uh, precipitation. Uh, they're looking at land surface temperature, air temperature. So these are all parameters. Uh, but if you were to just take a satellite image, like the one that we see on Google Maps, uh, or even in the open domain, uh, Sentinel, Landsat, MODIS, all these are images, and these images have a lot of information. Now, if you were to just reduce them to a parameter, uh, and say that parameter is uh, the health of some vegetation, or probably the percentage of uh, built-up area to non-built-up area, uh, how much water is actually there if the scene that you're looking at is a river basin. Uh, and if you can reduce every image into a parameter and uh, you already have a larger problem that you're solving, what you need is a higher sampling rate of these parameters because now you can start building the data set that will train a model to forecast. So today, any feature on the surface of the Earth uh, requires a lot of on-ground knowledge to start building these models, but you will be very, very spatially limited. You cannot look at very large spaces. And if you need to start building larger models to forecast what happens on the land uh, or even on the surface of the sea, uh, you need to collect a lot more information and they, they need to be reduced into parameters because otherwise you're dealing with large images and those images can be interpreted in different ways by different people, right? So the key thing is to get to parameters. So uh, today, this is certainly being done. Uh, it's not that edge computing is the only way to do it. Uh, it's been done post facto. It's also done uh, on uh, images that are being taken off the whole globe at certain frequency. So say we look at MODIS, it's, uh, it's able to take images of pretty much the whole world uh, once every day uh, for most parts of the world. Uh, now, if you were to derive one parameter from that, which is say uh, for a for a continent, what's the amount of water that is uh, uh, fresh water that's there? And you keep updating that. Uh, this has been possible. It has been done by a lot of people. In fact, some of you may have done these as projects in, uh, in school, university, or even uh, in your current jobs. Uh, but for this, you are getting the images down, they're being stored, uh, they're being analyzed, and then finally you're converting this into a parameter. And the parameter is usually very, very small compared to the original raw, raw data that is uh, was generated on the satellite. Now, with the advancement of 
computing and also in terms of the hardware that can enable that com computing you could have a, a far more sustainable way of doing this conversion from uh, observation to parameter uh, and that's that's uh, one of the reasons why edge computing has started uh, to become a little popular ar around the world which is can you convert the parameter on the satellite itself or once the data comes down to a receiving antenna on the ground like a satellite ground station can you run these algorithms at that ground station itself to reduce the data such that from that ground antenna to all the people who need to receive it they're just getting the parameter you don't have to have like a leased line which is capable of doing something like 10 to 50 uh, gigabytes per second as a uh, uh, internet connection you need a very moderate internet connection to do these studies and gain the insights that are necessary from this data so these are the places where the edge can be right so it could be uh, at a ground station which is receiving data it is not at the data center so it's getting closer and closer to the sensor edge if you put it on the satellite it is satellite edge computing and that's probably the uh, furthest it can go from the data center because it's literally on the satellite that is sensing the earth uh, so this is the gist of uh, satellite-based edge computing. And uh, there are different ways to uh, leverage uh, edge computing. What the example that I gave is more in terms of observing the Earth. But this is becoming more widespread in many other applications, including uh, communications. So a lot of uh, you may have heard of the Starlink constellation. The Starlink constellation allows internet to be given to any part of the Earth. Uh, there's a lot of edge computing happening there as well. So it's literally a switchboard on every single one of those 3,000 to 4,000 satellites that is able to intelligently route your uh, network traffic to another satellite, which transfers it to another satellite and finally goes uh, to a data center on Earth. So that's a lot of uh, uh, graph theory uh, running in real time across uh, a swarm of 4,000 satellites. So that's also edge computing. What we're talking about here specifically is observational edge computing, which is related to uh, uh, remote sensing. Now, if we are looking at uh, what does it really impact, what's the point of doing this? Uh, I'm summarizing them in these three points. Uh, first one is that you avoid a lot of bandwidth uh, investment uh, and investment is in terms of having a very high speed internet connection from ground station to data center data center to users uh, it is also that transmitting from space to ground requires very specific uh, very specialized hardware uh, and if you need to make them uh, send data faster you need to send a lot of images in a very short time it means uh, you need to put very very uh, expensive equipment on the satellite that increases the cost of developing the satellite, cost of testing it, uh, and mostly the mass of the satellite will go up, hence the launch cost goes up. Uh, and finally, when you're purchasing that data or you want to access that data, the barrier is there. So a lot of people, even if it is a government organization, they will put this uh, capital expense up front until they themselves have reaped the rewards of the data that has come. Till that time, they will not even share it with the rest of the world. Uh, this has happened uh, a lot of times. Even the US has refused to share some of its uh, data till they were able to get some return on investment uh, on that uh, initial equipment cost, launch cost, and then they opened it up. So it takes time. It really impacts. So uh, one of the things that are a uh, direct benefit of this is you can very quickly get a return on investment uh, by reducing the bandwidth uh, cost because this is not just a one-time investment to keep the uh, communication going, to send keep sending data down to the ground, disseminate it to users. It takes a lot of operational cost as well. So just imagine uh, internet or broadband bill. Uh, that bill need not be as big as it today. Uh, some of you who work with SAR data can really imagine just downloading one file can take you uh, you probably need a 300 Mbps link. I'm just talking about where uh, I am in Bangalore. Uh, that is a minimum speed uh, connection that I need to be able to not lose patience with downloading a SAR image. Uh, and those of you who have gigabits per second internet connection, you probably have forgotten about that pain. But uh, in space to ground communication, uh, 300 is a very big number. It is expensive. It costs at least half a million to maintain such a system. 
uh, which is like if you can bring that down by uh, two times by three times uh, there's a huge multiplier effect in the cost of keeping that system running and also disseminating data at a lower cost the second one is quicker generation of insights and what do you mean by insights uh, this would this would of course mean different things to different people but when you need to infer from from a parameter uh, it takes a lot less time because you already have your mental models and sometimes you have even machine learning models that can uh, give outcomes or probabilities or even forecast based on a few parameters but if you need to every time open a file uh, run uh, run something on every pixel uh, and then after that uh, come to the parameter and then use that parameter to do the next step you are losing a lot of time so there are lots of uh, real time problems real time monitoring problems uh, that today are having to deal with this uh, latency uh, and because of which you can only solve so many problems uh, so suppose we're looking at the wildfire problem that's now starting to develop in north america uh, it's it's only so much that you can do from up above uh, and then finally folks will end up using uh, uh, crude helicopters they will use uh, uh, airplanes to fight, fly, uh, uh, fly closer and closer to the fire, but there are lots of accidents also that happen. So if you're flying uh, way above the, the atmosphere, it's very safe. You have high resolution imagers, but then bringing that data down and processing it and actually figuring out what's happening on the ground. Are you able to uh, make a difference? Can you react even more uh, quickly to these dangers to people? Uh, these are things that we are not able to solve. and only by infusing new technologies can we actually uh, get there. So edge can contribute to this, but how best to use the edge, that is up to all of us. Uh, the third part is uh, data storage and computing costs. So uh, this is not very easy for any of us to accept, uh, but it is true that even though we have got the parameters we wanted from the images, we always have comfort in having the raw data available to us to do what we call as reanalysis. So there's always this thing that, especially in the scientific community, you would want uh, the ability to reanalyze raw data uh, when a new model has come out or a new way of understanding the world has come out. And this is this is not at all wrong, uh, but this is purely in the scientific community. And a lot of times, uh, the knowledge that is gained, demonstrated by the scientific communities, gets into the operational world. And they are put into work by engineers, a lot of uh, uh, geospatial analytics companies who are actually building solutions for the government, uh, enterprise, defense. Uh, these principles have been uh, developed to a point where they are mature. And since they are mature, what you're actually trusting is some metrics, right? You're uh, probably using a F1 score, probably using uh, IOU score. Uh, and these numbers have been quite consistently uh, high and you trust the models, the, the outputs that it gives. But still somehow that uh, the baggage that we bring from where the science came, we still want to keep the data ready at hand. So this really is, is, is a place where we're seeing uh, computer vision uh, industry working with nameplate re re uh, uh, registration with uh, even detection of people in video streams, in public webcams. Uh, all these, they don't really store the, the final image. Once they've made the inference, it's there. Of course, maybe if you, do, if you have very low confidence numbers, maybe you will still crop out that person's image and keep. But the objective is to make the system better with that, not to replace the uh, the parametric way of giving outputs with the images. Otherwise, then how much video data can be stored for posterity? You can never do that. Uh, so this is the this is the thing that edge computing now allows us to do, which is if you can really improve your models to a point where the only necessity is to have images where confidence on the inference is low. And the intent of keeping those images is to improve the model's accuracy over time and reduce the dependence on the raw data. Uh, edge computing gives this ability. Now, again, it is up to us to set and build systems that enable this. Uh, and uh, we believe over time, 
data storage uh, or recurrent uh, retrieval of the same uh, raw data uh, will drop. This certainly helps the, the whole world in reducing emissions because data centers are becoming a significant contributor to uh, the carbon footprints and data computing costs as well. So if you're starting to work on parametric data, uh, it's a lot less because you don't have to do as many transformations, which is again, on your lo local system itself, you will be seeing uh, the impact. You're probably dealing with CSVs rather than uh, multiple uh, net CDF or uh, geotiffs, uh, that sort of files. You're, you're just dealing with a CSV or a pr probably those are using new uh, data structure, data formats like say GeoParquet and uh, other uh, other uh, file types. Right, so you get down to just parameters. Now, uh, how different is it compared to what's happening uh, currently? So currently, uh, satellites are operated by a variety of organizations from national to uh, commercial. Uh, they own satellites. They mostly own their ground receiving uh, antennas. They are uh, they are on the ground, uh, sometimes very very far away from where the satellite uh, uh, building organization is. Uh, like India has uh, a ground receiving antenna in Antarctica. Uh, it's really far away, but Antarctica is very very useful because if you have a satellite that is going from pole to pole, so over the Poles, what we call as a polar imaging satellite, uh, it keeps passing over Antarctica and you can get a lot of data. Uh, but not many uh, organizations, including governments, can actually get a piece of land on Antarctica. They probably don't have the resources for that. And coming to commercial uh, enterprises, it's really not an option. You really can't uh, assume that this is possible. And even if you do have, uh, you're probably going to share a ground station with somebody else. Uh, and those ground stations may be built by somebody like Microsoft or Amazon. And yes, they are they are into the business of giving ground stations because that's an extension to their uh, 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 cloud infrastructure. So you can have cloud at the ground station, what we're calling that as edge. Uh, they do provide this, uh, but you always want to reduce that uh, uh, dependency right so so that your costs come down so that's how it is structured so uh, the satellite is up in space the receiving stations are spread across the world based on the type of uh, orbit that the satellite is taking and then you have large storage uh, which is uh, nowadays in the cloud but a long time back it was in uh, huge cabinets with uh, magnetic uh, uh, storage disks, uh, which house all the data. And uh, uh, that amount of data is usually, uh, if you look at it, more than 60%, this is like a diplomatic number, more than 60% of it is never looked at again. So these images are captured uh, and those who had requested for it, of course, would get to see the images, but nobody else. And most of the time, because the world is a big place and the number of people wanting satellite images are so few, uh, the, the scientific community wants to downsample all the data such that the whole earth is can be uh, read as a model, uh, while commercial enterprises and governments, when they're actually looking to uh, take specific area of interest images, uh, they look they they want to see the image in all its details. So between these two, you have a lot of images that are captured, which don't get an audience. It's not seen by anybody. Uh, and also uh, what happens is for say optical images, you have uh, cloud cover, you have a lot of quality parameters that really are not in your control. Uh, it's up to the satellite, it's up, uh, up to the atmosphere. Now a lot of that data is just useless. It, it comes down and it is stored away for some reason. A lot of people justify this saying that uh, atmospheric scientists will read this data, but no, uh, that is not true. Uh, they, they are looking at far different uh, data sets. They're not looking at optical images of clouds. And uh, if you look at uh, radar satellites, like say synthetic aperture radar, uh, a lot of the data that comes in is being processed for either land applications or sea applications. But the ones who are asking it for one or the other uh, doesn't really want the rest of the image, but that might contribute to a lot of the 
file size. So suppose you are looking at uh, ships in the sea. Uh, what's interesting for you is just the neighborhood of each ship, but not the rest of the sea. The sea is noise for you. Uh, there may be somebody else who is interested in the ship, uh, sorry, in the in the ocean uh, surface. Uh, but yeah, for them again, what do they want? Can they reduce their requirement to a parameter? So that's that's again what you see. So today, what's happening is based on the customer or based on the user. There's a lot of filtering, discarding of data that's happening of images after they reach the ground, and then after that, this this database is made available for folks to. Uh, analyze to run their models on top and actually take their uh, inferences out. And there could be a variety of commercial applications for this. There could be scientific applications, of course. But what we're looking at, problems that are profitable to solve. And those profitable problems are going to be what actually drives the community into an overdrive because there's a lot of opportunity now uh, to solve some, some problems and people are ready to pay for it. And why not attempt some of those problems? Because it, it's 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 almost like a bounty, right? Even this hackathon is a great way to see: can I build something that leverages these technologies and uh, can bring uh, benefit to somebody? Now, with edge computing, what what we've done is uh, you could take some of this uh, processing, some of the discard of data, put that into the uh, satellite itself. And by extending further, you could even build your own uh, analytical model uh, in order to uh, run on the satellite. You may have to do a few changes, and we will come to that. But if that is possible, you can bring a lot more efficiency into this chain that we're seeing. So you're not wasting data. You're not wasting a lot of power and resources to at the data center to keep data alive, even though there's a very low, low probability of anybody wanting to look at it again. Uh, and the other thing is application specific effort. So you are not putting effort on looking at anything other than a ship in an image. Uh, if that's very, very clear, if you're very clear about it, you want to only know where the ships are, uh, give only that piece of information. And that can actually be done with edge computing. And this is a great, great way to divide this whole uh, industry and community into those who are going to develop new methods to uh, derive information from satellites versus those who know what they want to do, but they want to do it faster, more efficient, and probably at a very competitive price point. So that's where uh, we as Kaiser uh, uh, try to educate people is edge computing is for those who know what they want to do with the data. Uh, but for those who are trying to figure out what to do with the data and develop new methods, you need access to raw data because you really will be setting uh, the tone for how the data is processed such that your application is served. Because if that is not known and you directly go to edge computing, uh, you're probably not going to serve yourself well. Now, uh, we've spoken about some applications, I've given some examples. Uh, we'll just try and uh, give give a, a pictorial representation. Uh, these, are, these are very exaggerated uh, illustrations. So uh, if you have uh, doubts about it, do reach out. So this is a way to uh, see that, suppose you had a large scene and this was uh, three three colors, red, green, blue, uh, and you were interested only in this location, in this area, and probably you wanted to know if uh, some road construction is completed or probably there's a settlement uh, which was having a lot of residential colonies. Uh, but this is your area of interest. You are not bothered about the rest of this Scene. But the satellite is built in such a way that it does take a large uh, image. I think this one would be probably 20 by 20 kilometers. And your area of interest could be uh, single digit square kilometers. And typically what we've seen, uh, those of you who have uh, procured uh, commercial data, you will have to buy the whole scene. It does not matter how small your area of interest is. If you can't pay for this larger area, uh, you you can't even look at this smaller area. Now, within that smaller area, if, if we just amp this up a notch, uh, if you wanted your, uh, you wanted to guarantee that you're looking at land and it since this is optical, there could be cloud cover and hence you can't see what is, is below the clouds. Uh, you need to know if this area of interest is clear of uh, clouds and only that time 
will you actually be able to derive your parameters of interest? And today, this is this is a real problem that uh, you will be able to know whether there is clouds or not only when you've seen the image. Uh, a lot of uh, effort has been put, put into training cloud masking algorithms, but those are today running on the ground. And you need the image to make that determination. And after that, you figure out, OK, my area of interest is actually not there. Let me wait for the next image. Uh, so what you could do is uh, tweak your model, optimize it to run on board the satellite, and do this filtering on the satellite itself. And once that is done, you actually get to work. So can you derive your parameters of interest? Do you want to look at just roads? You want to look at uh, settlements? You just want to uh, get, say, a GeoJSON uh, file that has the, a list of coordinates. So probably you want to get a mask. It could be a, like literally a binary mask that, that you bring down. You could post-process it. You could georeference it later on. Uh, you could do a variety of things, but you could do most of that heavy lifting on board the satellite. And the biggest achievement that you would have done is to not process the full scene, but only process your pixels of interest. And what you see below is how much you can bring down the size of this data. So the raw scene was 20 megabytes for red, green, blue. Uh, just your area of interest would be a few hundred kilobytes. And then finally, what you're looking for, if it's just a binary mask, it's like a single bit actually represents what's there in that pixel. It's either telling it is something is there or not there. You can bring that down to a two, two digit uh, kilobyte file. And this is really, really fast to send. You can just imagine uh, sending a date, sending a piece of data like this probably needs a one megabit per second uh, transmit from space to Earth. This requires something really, really tiny. This is actually possible to do with uh, uh, what we call as IoT uh, uh, IoT sensors. These IoT sensors are really, really uh, thrifty in the way that they packetize and send data. And this is this is something that people are trying to think now with edge computing. You can actually put this on a satellite, which is able to image a large area at high resolution. But finally, its outputs are so small. I could actually use very, very low cost. Uh, uh, radio equipment to push this data down to my users. And this is this is something else that will start becoming possible. Another interesting uh, uh, use case is, say, you're looking at uh, port areas. Uh, a very interesting thing for port authorities, uh, authorities is to know, uh, is to try and answer multiple questions on a daily basis. Uh, so one of them is just traffic management. It is uh, ability to get trends on a daily basis as to uh, which parts or which infrastructure of the port is getting used, uh, how much of the uh, seaward uh, area is being used for uh, traffic passing through, as well as your own operations of the port. So a lot of ships, if you just see here, if you were to say run a ship detection algorithm, uh, you can detect the ships, but then you can also see where they are. So in case you had uh, something like this, right? Say the uh, EEZ sort of boundary, or I've just drawn a fake line. This is not an EEZ. Uh, but you can start giving more value. So here you're just detecting ships uh, uh, with an object detection model. But if you were to bring more context, which is the location where these ships are, you could probably see that some of them are uh, outside the line, some of them are inside, that is closer to land. And if you were to go even further, like say you look at just one of those detections is a ship with a wake towards land, which means it is going seaward, it is exiting the EEZ. Uh, there could be some that do not have a wake, so they're just standing there, uh, probably they're waiting to uh, 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 get into the harbor. Uh, some of them may be entering, and this is this is good. So this this sort of stats today actually depends on the uh, ports uh, uh, tracking of the ships, and the ships need to have their beacons on and uh, really transmit their intent as well as their port of call. A lot of information, uh, but you also have a lot of ships that are not doing that. They are not really being honest. So this just with say. Uh, optical imagery, you could find these. And uh, you would, of course, say that what if it is overcast? You can use SAR data to do the same thing. But the intent is the same. The intent is to find parameters. And here, say the parameter is 
uh, uh, it could be number of ships, it could be locations of each ship, it could be uh, the nature or behavior of each ship uh, aggregated, it could be uh, different things for different people. But the uh, main thing is that you're able to ask the right question and come up with a way to answer it. So here, a tool to get you to answer that is to develop an object detection model. Now, how do you post-process that? That's completely up to you and how you want to tailor that to the insight you will uh, derive from uh, the satellite image. And just going back, if you were to just run object detection, there's one possible post-processing, post which is all the, uh, you just extract 100 pixels around every detection and just send all of them down, each of them with a black long tag. So now you have probably hundreds of images of ships uh, which over time you can track and sort of identify probably cross-reference with uh, uh, marine traffic uh, information. And your original scene here, uh, this is for another satellite, is this is close to 40 megabytes. Well, if you were to just do this job uh, in grayscale, as in if grayscale is useful to identify otherwise say red, green, blue, this is a, uh, like 670 kilobytes, that's all. It's a huge reduction from the original scene size. And you've already done, the, done your job. You've got the, the way the ship looks from above. Each of them is tagged with a uh, uh, lat long uh, coordinate pair. Uh, and here, if all you wanted to know is just ship uh, traffic statistics related to the easy boundary, it's just a small string and it it's like hardly a kilobyte. This is another uh, example to look at uh, change detection. And change detection is something that uh, many people have uh, uh, generally told this is this is going to be the most ground shattering uh, example of edge computing because this is literally a motion detecting camera in space that can look at very large areas uh, very, very rapidly. And it will be a game changer. But how do you build such things for the edge? Uh, we, 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 we probably can uh, uh, contribute in, in, in some of the stuff that we've done. But the key part here is being able to register the two images. So prior image and a post image, register them one above the other as accurately as you can, because only then can you start seeing what has changed. And there are many different ways to get creative about this, even if you can't really get knowledge of where this uh, particular scene is looking at. Uh, there are lots of uh, smart uh, uh, ideas that have been proposed over time, which is if you know what features you're looking for, and some of them are permanent and some of them are uh, changing over time, you can use the permanent features to uh, do this uh, registration and just see what are the other things that have that are not supposed to be permanent, where are they? So say here, uh, this is an example of uh, a corridor and within the corridor, uh, the say the user requirement is to know whenever anything changes, which is which reflects human activity, uh, detect that and give the coordinates of that. And for that problem statement, every time the satellite flies above, you will need to register the new image with the old image. And moment you register that, you need to see if there's anything that is of uh, uh, human uh, creation. So here there's a building that's got uh, not exactly building. I think this is a temporary cabin. Uh, which has appeared uh, just a few days uh, after the first image. And that can be uh, picked up. You could just do uh, some sort of uh, spectral distance uh, if you don't want to do anything fancy. Spectral distance and georeferencing is sufficient uh, to tell you that there's something significant that has changed. You don't even need to go all the way into training an object detection model. This is sufficient. And you can extract that, say, do some sort of uh, centroiding and find the uh, center of that feature and send that down. And of course, you could classify that later as encroachment or not. But in a sense, this is all that is there and you could uh, uh, really reduce the size of the file that comes down and hence also scale up the frequency and area that you can give such a service. So suppose you just wanted to give this security camera sp uh, from space as a service. Uh, this is a good way to do it. Uh, and what is your real contribution? It is to write the algorithm uh, to do that. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's about edge computing and what the possibilities are, what the advantages are, uh, and also the 
uh, an overview of what problems we could solve. Uh, we cannot uh, underline enough that the applications of any new technologies are like infinite, and it requires a whole community to come together to do that work. Uh, we at SkyServe, uh, we are we are an enabling uh, technology company, so we are leveraging some of the stuff uh, that has started getting popular, started uh, tipping the uh, balance, uh, and we're taking them to space. Uh, but the key thing is the user community really has to come together to leverage it and uh, de develop new ways to observe the Earth, new ways to deliver uh, value to uh, uh, the economy. So, so thank you. And uh, that's that's all that uh, uh, I had on edge computing. And I'll if there are any questions, you can take that before going into uh, the description of the challenge. Okay. So if uh, first of all, thank you, Aditya, for uh, giving an overview of edge computing and you've detailed out every single aspect of uh, uh, this new technology that uh, a lot of us are not familiar with. So I'll open up uh, the floor to uh, all of you who have questions. You can put on the chat or if you have any questions uh, or want to come onto the stage who are on the stream yard, uh, can raise their hand and I think I'll uh, put them on uh, the main stage. So we'll take questions. Uh, I'm seeing the YouTube live chat as well. So, any questions on edge computing or uh, in general about this technology? Uh, so Yamin is asking, so maybe how do I, okay. So Yamin is asking, how will be the integration of AI and Edge during this hackathon? Okay, so great question. Uh, I think Aditya, you can take up or maybe Gautam, how are we going to? Yeah, yeah I can take this. So, uh, so on the Edge, uh, the ability to process anything. So that's the key thing that uh, tells what we can do with edge computing. So uh, previously we used to have microcontrollers, which is sort of like the Arduino. Uh, that's that's the sort of compute that was there. Like typically they say, right, the the whole Apollo mission had computing power like one hundredth of an iPhone, uh, the first iPhone, uh, and uh, Today, the satellites are, are really amping up the amount of compute. So they're taking CPUs, which is, which is not a very uh, normal thing. It's just in the last five to seven years that CPUs have been taken. So which means you could run some applications that you feel uh, that you could run on a laptop. Uh, and now with uh, the very new generation of satellites, which is just the last two, three years, uh, GPUs are also being flown in space. So when, when we think about AI, usually we think about GPUs, uh, but it's it's not necessarily a, a, a mandatory requirement that to run AI, you need GPUs. If you have good CPUs, that, that is also good enough, but GPUs are very useful to train AI uh, on the ground. And uh, there are actually some very cool uh, folks, I think they are uh, in Belgium, they've actually come up with a way to train a model on live Earth observation data on the satellite itself. Uh, and that's taking it quite extreme. So uh, during this hackathon, you can propose stuff of that sort. Uh, but the key enabler is to be able to run a model very, very fast uh, on the edge, leveraging a CPU or a GPU. Uh, and that's, that's where the edge and AI start coming together because uh, AI inferencing many times has a prerequisite based on the uh, frameworks that you use. They have a prerequisite sometimes to do operations using GPUs. So now GPUs are as well available. Uh, and SkyServe is working with a lot of satellites that have this capability. Uh, so that is the integration of AI and Edge. 
uh, during the hackathon. So if you have any models that mandatorily require a GPU and you're really concerned, can it really work? Can I bring it here? Feel free, you can bring it here uh, and it will run quite fast. All right, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you have any more questions uh, regarding that, I think it will get much clearer as uh, after this, I, I think Gautam also will explain about the hackathon as well. So I think uh, Aditya has answered uh, your part, but if you have any more questions, we'll take it up later. So next question is, uh, are there any resources that can be helpful in applying edge computing to remote sensing applications? Uh, this is by Prashant. So. Uh, okay, so one second. Any resources? Yeah, so we will be uh, circulating some resources, but uh, apart from them, uh, in effect, when you're developing for uh, any remote sensing applications, I would say your process would remain the same. Uh, the same sources of data are still valid. Uh, the only difference is that here you cannot. Uh, take for granted the amount of time available to run these uh, because the resources on a satellite are not that many. Uh, so say uh, the power taken to run your model uh, can't be so high that they need to shut down the rest of the satellite right? because that is a finite resource. Uh, so these are things that we need to be very mindful. Uh, but apart from that, the methodology that you use uh, would largely remain the same. So if you were to break this down, uh, what frameworks could you use? What uh, uh, data types could you use? I think those, uh, some of them we will cover in the uh, next section of today's webinar. Uh, but those are the things that you can you can really adapt from cloud-based uh, uh, inferencing or running of models to edge, because that is the place where you cannot take liberties in say having a, a floating point 64 variable for anything and everything that we do, because like Python allows that uh, allows us to do that by default, but uh, the liberty of operating with such large uh, uh, data 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 types is not something that you would want to do on the edge. Because say you could just break that down into like a, a int eight data type that already is an eight fold reduction in the memory resources that you need. So it's those types of uh, optimizations that you need to think of. But from a functional point of view, you're not doing something drastically different. Uh, all right, so we'll move on to the next question, which is how do you envision the integration of AI models with existing satellite infrastructure for real-time data analysis? This is asked by Kiran. Yeah. Hey, Kiran. So, uh, so existing satellite infrastructure really doesn't cater to real-time data analysis. So that's something that is the change that we have to be a part of. Uh, because uh, the only places where this has got close to near real time or what we're calling as near real time is like basically 15 to 30 minute delay is in the weather uh, uh, domain. So we have a lot of satellites uh, positioned just above the equator as not just above, they're like 30,000 kilometers away from the equator above, but they're placed all around the, the earth and they're looking at the earth in, in almost like video. Uh, but that almost video is basically one image captured and delivered to you with a lag of 15 minutes. And then you process that to figure out what's happened. And at that distance, you mainly are only studying the shapes of uh, clouds and figuring out is there a hurricane or a cyclone or developing based on where you are in the world. So that's where uh, it is today. Uh, AI models today are being used to forecast from that data but not really figure out what's happening in that data because the, the weather sector really has figured out ways to uh, discern uh, things from, from this. But now if you're looking at land and you need to look at it at higher resolution, that's where real time really has not happened. Uh, a lot of uh, military and defense applications say that you have real time, but what they're getting from real time is actually just images. Now from images, what do you do? And that is where you need to really read a large image file, figure out which is your region of interest. And from that, uh, probably get some inferences. And those are not really real time. So that takes up to six hours after the image in the best case. 
And this is usually available only for search and rescue and disaster response. But typically, it could even take uh, two to three days. And uh, many enterprises are thinking, well, the satellite data is there. I can use it to monitor my supply chain. No, it's, it's, it's quite delayed. And if you want to get it more real time, you need to pay the same amount of money that governments pay, which is in the uh, five digit numbers in US dollars. All right, so we have one last question and uh, uh, this is, this person is asking, how can we get the satellite data to train our models? Will you guide us on how to get the data? Yeah, we'll cover that during the next part. Okay, fine. Cool. So I think those are the questions that we have currently. Um, maybe a lot of those doubts that uh, folks are having in the chat section will get cleared once. Uh, the description of the hackathon is uh, streamed or is presented after this. So I think, uh, thank you so much, Aditya, uh, for the wonderful presentation. I think now I'll bring up Gautam. Is it? You just check with Gautam. Is he speaking or? Gautam, are you speak. Or are you? I think, Aditya, you'll be taking it up. Yeah, that's uh, okay. That's fine. Just, so I think uh, okay. We I'll have, continue. We don't have any more questions. Um, I think we can move ahead uh, to the next section. Sure. Yeah. Just if you can keep both Rupesh and uh, Gautam available, so in case there are some other questions that they can pitch in. Sure. So I'll just add Rupesh also to the main uh, stage and Gautam. Yeah. And I'll move out. Sure. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah. So I'll just carry on in case there are questions. I think that let's all try and answer that. So uh, the problem statement that we're giving uh, is uh, can both of you mute in the meantime? Okay. Thanks. So the problem statement that we are putting out is based on a satellite. Uh, that we are arranging uh, such that any problems that we try to solve can be actually deployed to that satellite and we can demonstrate that AI on that satellite itself. So uh, it's it, it can it can basically just start with identifying a problem that satellite data can solve uh, and uh, the context for the satellite image usually is uh, how many spectral bands it has because most remote sensing uh, problems can actually be broken down in that way into the optical domain and then what's the spatial resolution it's around three meter resolution and this satellite can have a revisit of roughly once in two weeks uh, but this is again like a test bed for you so you don't need to necessarily think of this as I want to continuously monitor something that as it happens, I have to do everyday change detection. How would I do that? Because the satellite does not have such a like frequent update, uh, but this is a test bit. So anything that you feel at this scale and in this uh, spectral uh, domain of optical can be solved uh, by either a conventional uh, model or an AI model. Uh, we're not we're not very strict about uh, uh, that it has to be uh, a supervised learning sort of model, uh, but feel free to use them because that really will unlock the power of uh, edge computing because there's, there's a lot of stuff that can be done. Uh, so this is essentially the uh, uh, the definition of the challenge that look at this type of spatial and spectral information. What can you solve that is uniquely uh, poised to be done with edge computing? Uh, so there are uh, cases that we picked up, right? So you need to really think, if I had to do it the conventional way, am I uh, losing anything out? Uh, but if I did, did it with edge, is it solving something very unique that only edge could solve? But if it could be done even on the ground, it, it is okay if the data itself came to me in five days and then I took two days to uh, process it and once in a week I'm delivering some result. Probably really not. 
but if you're looking at a, a scenario in which probably the data needs to be delivered to somebody's handheld device, uh, you really can't be delivering GeoTIFF files, right? So uh, you would want to deliver just uh, parameters. And in that case, if you were to just think of a larger solution to the problem, where is this data really going to sit? And if you feel there are there's a uh, uh, stakeholder that does not mind, can really spend the money to store all the data in one place and even run the algorithm on top of that and serve out the results like basically like weather.com. They are aggregating a lot of satellite data, but what they're giving you is just temperature or humidity. They can afford to do that because the, that's the way the industry got uh, set up. But what you're doing, if it is different and there's a new stakeholder or this is a new industry that is going to get created by what you're building, uh, and you would not want them to have such huge uh, operational cost or capital investment, uh, you could think, okay, even if I'm delivering something in very, very, uh, like say weekly basis, but the cost of keeping data and computing that centrally or even distributed is too much. I would want edge computing. Great, that's that's a good way to look at the problem and to solve it. But you need to come up with such uh, uh, ideas. And those ideas will finally manifest themselves into some model that you build, uh, that you will train with uh, data that we can provide. And uh, at the end of the hackathon, we've, we've of course put in the schedule as well that you will be able to uh, run that and test whether it is edge ready. So is it a model that can run fast in space? Can it be, is it going to generate a lot more data than the input image? Uh, because that's really not what we want to do, right? We want to reduce the size of the data that comes down. Uh, and lastly, is it really making an impact for the problem at hand? Uh, so this is the problem statement. And if we were to look at uh, key milestones, uh, I think Kaman mentioned this uh, earlier as well. Uh, so registrations, uh, and the submission of the ideas that's the both have the same deadline it is the 5th of april uh, and the the next day uh, we will be uh, uh, announcing those who have been shortlisted and uh, those will be presenting their ideas uh, to to all of us we will be doing this session again and uh, that's when you will need to start putting more efforts towards uh, your model. So in the meantime, to assess whether your idea is solvable, you probably might just pick up uh, the stock models that are there, start retraining them, or probably even just assess off the bat, can they work? But for my problem, what post-processing do I need to do? Or what do I need to tweak such that it meets my requirement? Uh, so you will have time to do all of that all the way even till uh, the presentation day on 6th. But you will need to put more efforts to start getting them in a form that can be submitted in that last week, so 7th to 13th. So that's the structure that we've put. Uh, so we will be giving you guidelines on how to uh, build models that have more chance of really working in space uh, rather than not. And uh, you will get to test those models uh, uh, on our platform. We will we'll be giving assigning access to those who have been shortlisted uh, to, to test week you can keep iterating till i think the deadline comes which i'm guessing we are fi fixing at uh, 8 or 10 pm on uh, the 13th i think uh, uh, we can we can announce that uh, in the next phase uh, but this is essentially uh, what what would be happening and uh, there are a few resources that i want to uh, point you to uh, so this is uh, documentation of our platform it also has sample models on a notebook uh, that you can try out and see how they work. Uh, those are uh, those models are actually structured in a way that they can really, uh, the final output is like one zip file that can run uh, on our platform. This is the same structure that you would need to maintain your own GitHub repository as well. So the way the submissions would work is you need to organize your repository uh, and uh, share the repository uh, 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 folder link and from there our platform will be able to go test your data on uh, satellite images and give you feedback and then you can start uh, tweaking there and one of the questions that came 
that is satellite images that uh, you would uh, need to start testing. I would say any place where you can find uh, three to five meter data openly available, please go there, look for it. Uh, if your use case uh, mandatorily requires the data to be three to five meter, I would say, please put your request for what type of scenes you want into the Slack channel that Aman uh, shared in the beginning. Uh, we can start uh, sharing those images with you. Uh, and this is something that uh, you could uh, uh, you could ask throughout that period. Uh, but of course, be reasonable. Uh, we can we can give some types of images uh, at at some sort of scale. Uh, but yeah, we probably cannot generate too many images. So get very creative about how you can augment the training data uh, and how you go about that that whole process. And that is also something that we will be uh, evaluating you on, as in how inventive and uh, industrious you are in getting to solve that problem. Because this is the same problem that everybody else faces, which is if you're building something for high resolution, how much training data can you really get? And there's only so many places that open data is made available. Uh, and we will share some of those links in the in the Slack channel as well. Uh, uh, Rupesh, would you want to take them through uh, the a sample notebook? Yeah, yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, I'm audible, right? Yeah, I can hear you. I'll just stop my uh, screen share. Just a second. Uh... We are at uh, is the screen visible? Uh, no. Okay, wait once I've added to the stage. Yes. Let me know when it's uh, uh, yes, visible. It is visible now. All right. Uh, all right, folks. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Rupesh from SkySub team. Uh, so as uh, Aman has already shared the link to the GitHub Gitbook Docs link, here you can find a resources tab over here, which has a sample collab notebooks as well as one one is a Google collab notebook, one is a Kaggle notebook, and both of which are uh, for a different use cases. So one is basically a Google uh, Euro based on the Eurosat Mad model, which works on 10 meter Sentinel data, and that uh, that is a classification based model. And the second notebook that you have here is a road network detection model, the one of the kind which Aditya showed in the presentation, wherein you put in a given image and it will extract the road uh, road networks from that image. So if you go to this link over here, uh, the where it points to the notebook, so you will have a collab notebook uh, open over here. So basically, this is uh, based on the Eurosat land use and land cover classification using deep learning. So what you uh, so this will go through the starting steps that is procuring the data till the end that is uh, making this entire collab notebook or entire folder structure in a way that follows the sky submission guidelines and which you can submit on the platform that we will share on 13th of april so uh, here the uh, if i were to go on broadly so the first step would be just getting the data preparation so as i mentioned this works on sentinel 2 data so now here would be the tricky part that you try to get the data as close as close as a resolution possible to the actual problem statement, because what might happen is uh, you might see different results uh, while training and testing on say 10 meter versus the 3.25 meter data that we would be providing on 13th and before as well as Aditya mentioned based on request basis. So if we go um, the first step, basically it installs a couple of libraries which includes uh, TensorFlow and a specific version of TensorFlow and ONNX format. Um, also ONNX, just a second, it installs ONNX as well. Uh, after that, what it does is it, it tries to download all the data set from the given URL. And what we will do is we will just uh, print those uh, labels and the shape of the data that we got just now. And after that, if we can see that we are printing the image labels that we have. So we have 10 different categories over here, uh, as you can see over here. And these are the number of images that we have for the given category. So basically for annual crop, annual crop we have 3000 images, similarly, et cetera, et cetera. And we have just, uh, you just visualized the image and that looks something like this. And now what we will do is we'll just uh, 
do some couple of basic pre-processing MLEI steps where we'll just balance the classes to so that we don't have biasness in the training data. And after that, I'll just quickly go down. Yeah, so the first, mo uh, first model which we have is just a very basic uh, uh, single dense layer model. And as you can see, the efficiency is 22%. But in the, uh, in the end of the notebook, you have links to various other models reaching up to 85 to 90%. So the link is there. You, uh, you can try those models as well. And now what we are doing is um, what we will do is prepare this model. Uh, as you can see, we are adding the layers on the machine learning model. That we, It's a very simple model, as you can see. And now we will train it to 100 epochs. After that, uh, we have a couple of graphs for the accuracy values, the original and the between the training and testing. Just a second. And so one more thing to note is uh, currently the platform accepts ONNX format only. So even if you're making models in TensorFlow or PyTorch or other libraries, we would like you to convert to the ONNX format. The reason being is that we have seen on our experience that the ONNX format is very much compatible across different hardware devices that is flown onto this edge in moments. And hence, uh, having converting all the models to ONNX ensures the seamless deployment and uh, inference on the actual hardware as well. So we have the steps over here, which you can follow for different PyTorch and other libraries as well. We have a separate uh, Collab notebook as well, which is uh, present over in the this documentation page that uh, has specific steps only for model conversions. And yeah, so basically we install some of the libraries, we load the model and we convert it to ONX format. Here, if any kind of custom dependencies you have, uh, which you are writing for the functions while creating the model uh, in the previous cells, you might have to specify those here. Also, uh, we have some restrictions on the offset level, which is written here as 11. Uh, so again, you will have to see when you're converting whether all your functions which are using in the TensorFlow or PyTorch or other libraries when converted to this offset level 11, is it supported or not? Again, the documentation for the same end links are present in on the end, which shows the supported functions at different offset level. And finally, once we created the um, ONNX model, we are just performing a basic inference on that ONNX model. And you can see we have some class probabilities for each of the classification types that we had shown earlier. Now comes the main, uh, so till here, it is the basic uh, machine learning AI step that um, you might be familiar with, that you have get the data, you run it, you create an ONNX based model. Now to make sure that this runs on the edge platform and uh, on the sky search platform that we you will have access to, there are a couple of guidelines regarding the model folder structure and other basic things uh, that we need to follow. So first thing is we need to follow our directory structures as specified over here. So in the models folder, you will have your model. Utils can have any utilities that you have. On the sample data input and output, you will need to specify an input image that you tested your model with and a corresponding output that you actually saw when, when running this model on your system. So the reason for this, if you might be wondering, is uh, since Aditya also mentioned that these are edge hardwares and every hardware has a different architecture and other parameters, we need to make sure whether the input that goes into the model and the output that comes is as what you expected when you were actually running it. If not, then we will come, uh, you will get the appropriate error messages or information logs to make sure that it matches in that environment. So that is what we will be testing. So you will be putting, uh, you will put some input sample in input images as well as a corresponding output that your model generated for those input images. Now, for the sake of simplicity, we have just mentioned that any output that your main.py, main.py, we have kept it as an inference file. All other files and all other libraries, helper functions can be kept inside utils folder. So when we run that main.py, we expect that the model writes the output in the given runtime folder, inside this runtime folder. And any intermediate files that you might need uh, while uh, suppose you are doing some tiling methodology or something else, and in between those intermediate files are generated, you might want to put it in the intermediate folder present here. And the rest is the requirement.txt, which will specify what are the libraries that are required for your model to effectively run, uh, since that would be present on your local system. Here also, we strongly suggest that please do model development on the virtual environment, because you might see unexpected results if you don't do inside virtual environment as your base 
uh, system libraries, Python libraries, it will affect the actual uh, model libraries. So here is a couple of code which will automatically create the model uh, structure defined here. More details about this and entire is present on the documentation. Also, we would be available to help you understand if there is any confusion. So this will automatically create the folder structure. Then we will add some sample input data to that uh, given folder, as I mentioned, and also converted model, which we did on the previous step uh, over here, convert the model to ONX. We'll put it over uh, in this models folder. And now we are just writing a main inference script. So this inference script, you can add, write it in Colab. I've, I've just written in the cell environment and I'm writing it down using a magic method to the main.py. But you're free to, if you're using visual code or some uh, studio code or something, you can just directly write the inference. And we will write the inference. And just quick uh, suggestions would be a pre-processing step um, that we would uh, please make sure that the input images might not be as always as the one in which you trained on. So any appropriate pre-processing or post-processing step that you would require, uh, please do put in the main inference function. And apart from that, the output also has a particular structure uh, that we expect it to be. Uh, if I go to just a second, I'll just go to the appendix over here in the documentation. And as you can see, these are the output types that we, uh, that we support. So basically, uh, the first one is um, getting an image. An output will again be an image and each pixel value is an integer. Second one would be uh, put, uh, getting an image and uh, the second one would again be float, the pixel values. Then we have segmentation, which includes binary and multi the class segmentation. And similarly, we have something for object detection, both a point based detection and a bounding box. So these are the kind of output that we expect from your model when uh, you are actually running them inference.py that it should display a JSON in these scenarios a uh, binary mask or multi-segmentation mask with n number of classes. And in this case, when you specify any image type and the output, whether it's integer or float, we will actually check on the platform whether that is being adhered or not. So going forward, uh, we just created, uh, you just can put the all the dependencies you have from virtual environment. And after that, we just uh, we will just create a virtual environment and test the entire uh, repos structure. And as you can see, I created a virtual environment, installed all the dependencies, and then uh, then ran the output as well. And successfully, we have generated few outputs from this one. And what we will do is, since these are present in the runtime folder, which I mentioned earlier, we'll just move it to output folder. So that is what you will do. So in the uh, in the actual run, uh, it will always uh, put the um, inference on the runtime folder. But during just the first submission where you have tested it, you just have to copy paste or cut basically the runtime folder outputs into the output and put it in a GitHub repository. And the subsequent testing will happen in the platform that we will share. And finally, we are just doing the zip of the model repository. So the, here you will give the access to the uh, basically a Google uh, Drive. So you will have a entire folder model folder structure here. And once you create the zip, you will have a, a zip of that which will be downloaded to your system. And then the remaining steps are to create the GitHub repository uh, and push it to the push the entire uh, zip which you downloaded, you know, unzip it and create a new repository, push it over there, and the subsequent processes will happen on the search platform. Um, yes, uh, so this is the process for one of the classification models, and similarly you can go through the resources section to see uh, the Kaggle notebook for the road network segmentation as well. The initial steps are related to model, how it's trained and data set and preparation and et cetera and model generation. And the remaining steps would be same, which is like model submission guidelines, the folder structure, and how you would want to push it to the GitHub repository. All right. Um, yeah, that's it, uh, Aditya. Uh, I think, uh, is there any questions on this one? I think we have Dave's yeah. questions. Uh, I just ask uh, audience, those who are or participants, those who are in uh, the chat, uh, if you have any questions about uh, the documentation or you want to, if something is unclear, you can directly ask. Uh, so we'll be providing the webinar recording and also all the resources to the Slack channel and also the WhatsApp group for the participants. So the, those have not registered yet. 
uh, we have the link on the youtube slack and all the channels uh, that we are across Well, I think there are, if there are if there are there are questions coming up or uh, even if you're not able to answer them i think you can just direct them all to the slack channel and whatsapp group uh, and uh, the so we have one more uh, slide uh, just to take people through uh, this is on how we are evaluating so maybe we could just take them through that if there are no more questions okay i think you can share your screen uh, meanwhile if there are any questions i'll uh, put them on the screen yeah with them okay, okay. i've had to okay. yeah yeah so this is the url we will uh, paste this into the other resources as well so uh, so for the first round where you need to propose the uh, the problem and your own methodology of how you're going to solve it with uh, ai and edge computing with satellites so this is the rough uh, breakup the most important thing is of course the problem solution formulation so identifying a relevant problem and uh, your own uh, understanding maybe it's literature survey maybe it is giving references as to how, how it has been solved so far or if anybody else has solved that but edge computing would have really solved it completely uh, so those parts are are the most important uh, and uh, then the weightage is split between how you uh, go about building the model what's your workflow uh, how what did you choose to be the data set why did you choose that uh, what is the sort of provenance of that data so how many people uh, probably have proven that this problem can be solved with, with this this type of data set um, and your own uh, method right so how did you uh, generate enough training data to give you give you give yourself a good confidence that yes this model is going to do do uh, good things it's not going to misidentify uh, uh, patterns in the data and uh, the second one is how different is your idea and this is all this is uh, relative uh, it is going to be based on the cohort that is uh, submitting this of course uh, all of you could generate very very unique ideas that's not there uh, but then we will down select based on relative uh, uniqueness uh, because the key part here is the degree to which uh, uh, edge computing is being leveraged to solve the problem uh, as as we said earlier right how do you know whether this problem really needs edge computing to solve or not that is up to you uh, you can choose the problem you can choose the way you want to solve and also the context in which it will get solved Uh, so that contributes towards uniqueness so uh, it it could be in many different ways it could even be using a, a model that is not generally used in space you br brought that in that can be a part of the uniqueness uh, it could it could also be the method that you're using for pre pre and post processing of uh, the data and the model inference as well so there are lots of things but you need to show that off in your uh, proposal uh, you you will not be submitting the model itself in this first round so you need to write that you need to tell what you are going to do which is going to be different and uh, why your proposal needs to be taken up and uh, uh, the model that you build can be presented into uh, as pushed into a satellite the last part will be the q and a that happens on that day itself so i think i i made a mistake so all the submissions will be uh, Uh, evaluated uh, for the first round so at the end of which at end of each presentation we'll be having q and a and how you answer those questions that's the uh, uh, last uh, metric so there is no short short listing of the submissions without the presentation so it's just the deadline for submitting that is fifth on sixth is when you will present and we will uh evaluate basis that so just so that there's no confusion just wanted to clarify that part 
so yeah so this is the judging criteria and uh, yeah that's that's pretty much it if there's there's more questions i think we should be able to take them up there is just one question uh, as of now which is uh, references of research paper should uh, those be shared so that i think the question yeah, is yeah. Uh, yes yes so how see the main thing is to be able to uh, establish that this is a real problem and the methodology to solve it you are not spending time solving it like from the ground up uh, and i would really uh, encourage you to take where the state of art is and push it further uh, this is also something that we discussed about edge computing right so edge computing should not be used to try and solve a problem that has not been solved it is to push the boundary of how you can use that uh, solution to fully uh, close the loop so please use very well established uh, research as the backbone of what you do and wherever you have to please cite them uh, give references uh we do not want uh, uh to to miss miss the original contributors towards the idea so do 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 go about it if you want to in a slightly academic way uh please cite all references all right so there's another question on the evaluation criteria what is the date uh, folks are asking prashant is asking is it april 6 yeah yeah so what we should put here Uh, okay so this is the timeline so the last date to submit uh and uh, submit your uh, presentation is 5th uh we will be evaluating on the 6th on a, a conference call uh, is is that correct aman and yes Atom? yes 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 so all the all the judging criteria that we are uh, mentioning about right now it's only for the qualifier round it's it's, it's for the qualification for the hackathon point yep all right i think we can take more questions uh if there are any more questions from the chat Yes, so just just wanted to add uh, to one of the question that came up. Uh, you know, uh, I think Yamini had asked long on the question that we got. How we'll be integrating AI and Edge during this hackathon? So uh, just to clarify, I think Aditya had already clarified that uh, we wouldn't be directly deploying it on board right now. I mean, this it's the live hackathon is will only test it for Edge readiness. So just want to reinforce on that that. Uh, we'll be using Kaiso's platform to, uh, you know, test this, test the model, and iterate on it to make it edge ready. So that's that's the uh, that's where this ends. And based on that, we'll be uh, announcing the hackathon winners. So while you might also stand a chance that if if your idea and the model is great, uh, and it's it's a mere chance that uh, you know if it's really so great that we find it really, uh, you know. such a innovative uh, model that we can actually put it on 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 board a satellite then we we might take it up for uh, one of our upcoming mission uh, and you know actually fly it into space so that is just a chance that you stand but you know uh, that's that's not a promise yeah the only promise is the cash prize that you have the top 3 winners will be getting uh, the cash prize that we have promised i think aman has uh, given the details regarding it yeah that's that's my two cents yeah gautam probably has, has has told it in a more business like manner but <laughs> i'd really like to find really like to find very good uh, uh, problems that are being solved and uh, would really like to do wh- whatever it takes to get that to fly uh, i think we should we should try and uh, promote it there's a great idea uh and the key thing is what what you're doing is is over two two and a half weeks you are probably not going to get the best model or the best edge ready version of it uh but if it's a great idea we will will support you also to make that uh to make that uh, delta up uh so don't worry about that the key thing is get the best idea there is uh and then work as much as you can uh most hackathons generally give uh i think uh, 
uh, enough reason to like stay awake and the lots of i think 24 hour hackathons and stuff like that so this is spreading it over uh, some time uh, but yeah the key thing is the effort the idea and if there's a, something unique and stuff uh, we uh, really want to support that and make it run uh, as Gautam says, there's there's no guarantees in space, uh, but I would really like to see some ideas that like, come up to that level. Great. I think there's another question. There's some confusion. I think so. Prashant is asking uh, for qualifier round. Uh, do we have to submit the model? No, it's it's not required. Though if you've started to build it and you want to put some results into your uh, presentation you are free to do that uh, so but you will not get access to the platform to test it whether it can run on the satellite before uh, that before 6th april so you will get it only after the shortlist only shortlisted candidates will be given access so till before that you can continue to use the resources the uh, examples that rupesh uh, shared uh, you can build forth from there you can build your own models uh, you can continue to do all of that. Uh, it's just that if if you feel you want to hedge your bets, you don't want to build it, you want to build it only after the uh, qualifier round is done and you're selected, that is okay, uh, completely okay, but then you'll have even less time. So it's this is also an element of the competition. How do you plan your time? How resourceful you are? So, yeah. Okay, so questions? also wanted to address one question that Aman that we had got before this uh, stream started regarding the IP and other things. So just to make it sure, uh, you know, I think all of these things are actually included in, uh, you know, SkyServe's privacy policy, since we are also working with a lot of other uh, developers who are submitting models uh, on our platform and, you know, uh, putting them on our uh, edge computing platform or whatever it is. So we, we have a privacy policy in place that says uh, any IP of the model uh, that has been created uh, will be off the developer itself. And we wouldn't be getting, uh, you know, any anything, any IP sharing or anything of that sort. Uh, uh, so even the same applies for this hackathon that uh, all the IP of the model that you are building will will stay with you only, and we'll have nothing to do with it. Okay, great. Good to know that. Uh, thanks, Prashant, for joining. So, Prashant is saying thank you, Team SkySurf, for. Uh, thanks, Prashant. Uh, all right, I think. That is all. Gautam, uh, Aditya, Rupesh, you have anything to add? Uh, to this? Um, no, I guess I'm good. Um, for any more questions, I think Slack channel we would be creating. So any questions we can take over there. Okay, so important things. Uh, please join the Slack channel. Second thing, uh, the qualification round is on April 6th. You have to register by April 5th and submit your presentations by April 5th. So that is the first step that you would want to complete as soon as possible. So the main criteria is your idea. If the idea is unique, you get, you have better chance to uh, qualify. And also maybe, um, I mean, as Skysurf team said, they'll support you if the idea is great. So the key is the idea here. All right. Well, I think that is all the questions we have. Uh, Gautam, Aditya, if you have anything to add at the end before we close this up. I think looking forward to more people to register and, you know, even if probably they are new to this or, uh, you know, uh, they are scared to actually take this plunge into, you know, trying their hands on this new thing. It's OK. You can you can give it a try. I mean, we are here to support you. So whatever communications necessary between uh, the SkySub team, my Triple G RSS team, uh, Let's Talk Special team will uh, communicate within ourselves and try to help you out. So I, I think we also have a, a WhatsApp group for the preliminary communication that we have uh, that we have sent out. So everybody, please join that WhatsApp group that is that 
will be sent to you once you register uh, on your e uh, emails probably and or we'll try to add you on those uh, whatsapp group however uh, Aman wants to take it so that is one thing and next any other queries uh, eventually would be uh, you know, if technical would be taken up on the slack channel yes so please uh, spread the word and uh, ask everyone to join don't uh, shy away from trying out new things i think a lot of folks have might have heard edge computing for the first time uh, so uh, that is why a lot of hesitance in uh, taking this up but i encourage everyone to uh, uh, participate with full confidence uh, we are here to support the skysafe team is has been uh, active throughout before the hackathon as well with uh, helping hosting this hackathon so their efforts should not uh, go in vain they are helping you out in developing new skills so hope everyone uh, participates with full uh, energy uh, hope to see more uh, participation with that i think uh, thank you aditya gautam rupesh for uh, the entire presentation giving guidelines and also encouraging audience to take up something new um, if you have any questions there are two main channels slack and uh, email and whatsapp will add once you register but if you have any technical questions those are the channels uh, that will be uh, publishing on um, thank you for all the participants who have joined uh, online on YouTube or on uh, StreamYard. I uh, hope to see your uh, participation and questions if you have any on the Slack channels and emails. Uh, with that, uh, we come to an end. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, see you after two weeks. Yeah, on April 6th. All right. Bye. Bye bye. All the best. See you on the channels, WhatsApp and Slack, firstly. Yeah. See you guys. Bye-bye. All the best.